Okay, everybody, welcome. Uh, today, I'm joined by Dr. Marta Perez. You guys all know her here on Instagram. Uh, she's a, a board-certified OBGYN at WashU in St. Louis. And are you off today? I'm on nights this week. I'm a laborist. Mm -hmm. So, a laborist. yeah, I, yes, yes, I yes. worked last night, and I, I'll go back in tonight. Perfect, perfect. Well, I am not assigned today. I'm just doing admin stuff and working on lectures, but I'm on call tomorrow, so. Nice. <laughs> I'll make up yeah, it for I'm sure tomorrow. you're busy. Yeah, so we're just going to jump right in. Um, what I did was put out a call on social media about certain questions people had. Then I kind of organize them so that they kind of flow and make sense mm -hmm. as we go along. And we're going to get through as much as we can. And I'm going to try to leave about 10 minutes at the end to answer some of these questions. So here we go. Dr. Perez, uh, can we request vaccinated nurses when we go into labor? I get that question a lot. What say you? Yeah. So you can absolutely ask. And some important things to be aware of is if someone says, well, we can't disclose the vaccination status of our staff because it's a privacy concern like HIPAA or something. It's actually not. Um, and so you can say, I don't think that's accurate um, mm -hmm. or tell the person that's not accurate. However, if you know there's still pushback or you're not getting the answer that you want, then oftentimes what you can do is ask to speak to like a nurse manager on the floor. Often these things can be elevated. Um, or another thing is that you can look at a lot of the institutions that have vaccine mandates for their employees um, many of them have over 90% vaccination rates because of the mandates, but for mm -hmm. every mandate, there are exceptions. People have religious exemptions, et cetera, that don't get me started on that. But mm -hmm. um, a lot of times you can ask for the percentage in that unit of vaccinated. So you may feel comforted knowing, oh, well, they won't maybe tell me the status of my nurse, but 96% of all the nurses on this unit are vaccinated. So like the chances are my nurse is vaccinated. So um, that's something I would say is best probably discussed prior to hospitalization. So if yes. you're already hospitalized, you can ask, but something to oftentimes your OB might know. And if not, they'll be able to talk to, or you can talk to someone in leadership at, of nursing leadership at labor and delivery. Yeah. I think the more you could plan ahead and ask those questions ahead of time, rather than uh, as you roll in and labor is better. So if it's a concern that you have going in, ask ahead of time. There are hospitals that don't have vaccine mandates. Mine is one of them. So uh, it might look different than some of those, that the vaccination rate is gonna look different than some of those hospitals that do. So yeah. that is a legitimate question to ask. The other question I got was with the CDC changes as far as quarantining and isolation, or, or mainly quarantining, have changed. Um, and yes, I just wanna say, I, uh, getting people back to work when they're not symptomatic, healthcare providers especially, I understand the importance of that because we are stretched very thin. Mm -hmm. But I also understand the concern on behalf of the patients. I do. Yeah. And so, not every hospital, though, is doing the five days and right. back. It should be right. said, like, my hospital is actually keeping it at seven. So, so that's another question to ask. That's where I was going. Yep. But yeah. Because even though the CDC put that out, it doesn't mean that's what your hospital is doing because right. mine's not. So yeah. that's the next question to ask. Are you guys following the CDC guidelines for the new guidelines for quarantining and isolation uh, versus not? So, again, just because the CDC put that out doesn't mean everybody's following it. Exactly. Schools are doing something different, can do something different. Hospitals could do something different. So those are just guidelines. So yeah, that's a good question to ask as well. Would you agree? Yeah, absolutely. I think that's, and that's a, something I think patients have the right to know. Yeah, absolutely. They do. Um, okay. So the next question would be, where did it go? Um, here. If I come down with COVID, especially later in pregnancy, what should my first moves be? Should I call my OB? Your first moves should absolutely to call your OB. If you happen to, um, you know, people are going to find out one of two ways. They get tested on their own and find out they're positive because they got exposed or they're starting to feel sick or they got sick, went to the hospital, like a lot of my patients do, and they get tested in triage or on labor and delivery. And that's how they find out. Mm -hmm. So if you happen to find out outside of the hospital setting, then yes, absolutely call your OB. Um, if you find out in your, in the ER, you're on labor and delivery, they're going to tell you what to do while you're there. But if you happen to not be in the hospital setting or a clinic setting or some kind of hospital setting, then you definitely need to call your OB. Um, it's important also to find out now what the protocols that your uh, uh, OBGYN's office or uh, obstetrical care provider's office have in place. Um, you know, is there a certain number I call? Um, you know, do I need to let you know before I come in that I have COVID positive? And it's the same thing. As much notification as you can give, the best. Now, if you're acutely <laughs> ill and you have to come in, then you have yeah, to come in. Come I'm in not right away. Tell you, yeah, you just got to go. But if you're not that sick and you can give us a heads up, that's always appreciated. Um, here's a few things that you need to do to call 911 for and or be seen urgently. 
And these are all related to low oxygen saturation. So these are some of the signs. If you have a hard time breathing or shortness of breath, shortness of breath over what you're normally experiencing, uh, ongoing pain or pressure in the chest, sudden confusion, which is a sign of hypoxia or low oxygen levels, yep. uh, being unable to respond to others, blue lips or face. Those are all signs that your oxygen satur saturations are not where they should be. And those are indications that you need to be seeing ASAP. Um, where that means you go, to go ahead. And as I say, it's important too, because in pregnancy, we need yes. an even higher amount. And yep. some of the normal blood oxygen concentrations for non-pregnant people may be actually abnormal for a pregnant yep. person. So that's something that you and I as OBs know really well, yes. but that, you know, sometimes other providers may not always pick up on. So, yeah. so if you're pregnant, we will tell, we don't tolerate as low of an oxygen saturation as if someone's not pregnant. In other words, because you need your higher oxygen to also oxygenate the pregnancy and the fetus. Yep. So those guys, they're not equivalent. You don't treat the oxygen saturation levels the same as you would for pregnant and non-pregnant. So that's important to know. Um, and then also if you're a family member or someone who's pregnant, those are things to watch out for as well. Yeah. Um, okay, next question. If I get COVID, what about trying to get monoclonal antibodies ASAP as opposed to waiting to see if symptoms remain mild? So this is a great question. Um, just to back up a little bit about monoclonal antibodies in general in pregnancy. So monoclonal antibodies are created in a lab. There are specific antibodies that target a specific part of the COVID virus, um, usually the spike protein. And there's several different monoclonal antibody therapies that have emergency use authorization via the FDA. Monoclonal antibodies against COVID ha weren't studied in pregnancy when they were created, just like vaccines weren't. And we, since they've been available, we haven't yet seen robust published data on their safety. However, we don't anticipate there being any safety concerns. These types of products, not outside the setting of COVID, have been used in pregnancy before with overall reassuring results, depending on what the target is, right? So yeah. the target for this one is against a virus. Other types of medicine and monoclonal antibodies, the target might be something in the human body. And so that would, you'd use with caution in a fetus. But this one against the virus, we would, we would think it to be safe. Um, and the issue that we're starting to confront with monoclonal antibodies um, are a few indications. So indication of monoclonal antibodies are um, for preventing the progression of severe disease. So they're used for mild symptomatic before they get really ill and need to be um, seen and kept in the hospital for treatment. Um, it can also be in the set of um, exposure prophylaxis, a really close exposure. Um, it can be given to decrease the chances of getting it. But having a few issues. One is that we're having a really severe surge right mm -hmm. now, mm -hmm. and monoclonal antibody products are becoming hard to get. Yep. Um, the second issue is that the Omicron variant may not respond as well to some of the monoclonal antibody mm -hmm. products. There is one that looks like it's responding better to. But again, that one may be in short supply. Mm -hmm. My region is actually, even though we're surging out of control with COVID, we're actually last published data, which was from the end of December that I could find 85% Omicron in my state. So we're still offering both products because it's not the predominant variant yet, although I'm sure it will be very soon. Um, the second issue is obviously triaging who needs them the most. So yeah. we're starting to see considerations of perhaps we prioritize monoclonal antibodies for the people who are unvaccinated because vaccines do work at preventing mild mm -hmm. disease from becoming severe disease pretty well. So, you know, TBD, again, this is something definitely to discuss with your OB doctor or your high-risk OB doctor. And I bet your mm -hmm. OB doctor is communicating mm -hmm. with their colleagues in high-risk OB mm -hmm. about this. Um, and everything is changing kind of day-to-day -day and week-to-week -week about availability. So what we say right now mm -hmm. today may not be the case tomorrow, and it depends on geographic location as well. Yeah, and going to touch on what a lot of the monoclonal antibody that was being used in pregnancy was Regeneron, and it's not effective against Omicron. So the other one would be Sotrovimab, but yeah. uh, it's limited in availability. So at my hospital, pre and the Delta period, our patients got Regeneron if they met criteria, and there are certain criteria that are needed to be treated with monoclonal antibodies as an outpatient with COVID, and as someone who's hospitalized. And it generally goes on patients with certain risk factors and pregnancy is one of them for being at increased yeah. risk for severe disease. So it's generally the rule of thumb uh, that's being followed. However, every hospital might have their own individualized protocols for monoclonal antibodies. Now we're not giving Regeneron because we're predominantly Omicron. 
So it's yeah, I think us. we will be soon too. Yeah, I mean, we 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 we've been. Of course, it's Texas, so I'm not surprised. But um, yeah, so we do have the other monoclonal antibody, but it's on restricted use because it's just we don't have as much of it. So you yeah. know, that's another thing to to know. So if you have COVID and you have mild to moderate disease and you meet the criteria for monoclonal antibodies, then of course you need to let someone know so you can be evaluated to see if you're a candidate for either inpatient. Obviously, if you're sick enough to be inpatient and you meet the criteria, you'll get it, but as an outpatient as well. And again, yep. unfortunately, it's gonna depend on how sick you are and which uh, uh, monoclonal antibodies are available uh, where you're at. And it should be noted for a lot of places too, you can't even get it in patients, so specifically yeah. people who qualify for outpatient management. So if you're too sick, yes. then you may not qualify for use. Right. So yeah. that's the other thing is that especially in unvaccinated individuals, often they go from feeling really mild to feeling severe really quickly before they can get mm -hmm. monoclonal antibodies. And then it's not even an option, which is why your best bet is trying to prevent not only COVID, but also severe disease with vaccination. Right. And so people have asked me a lot about uh, giving monoclonal antibodies. And, and as Dr. Perez said, it's uh, not been studied this specifically for COVID, but we have used monoclonal antibodies for other things in pregnancy. And we are extrapolating those safety data to this. But we're also in a pandemic where pregnant patients are at increased risk for severe disease and we got to treat them. We can't just say, no, you can't have it. That's not the right approach to take right. as well either. Exactly. As long as you're educated on it and, you know, uh, it, and you agree to it, you know, that's fine. Take it. And we do give it to a lot of our patients here. And I have, um, so it, it does have some, yeah. some success. We just don't have that data published yet. Um, and the SMFM, yeah. ACOG, uh, all support using monoclonal antibodies in pregnancy, uh, when needed. Okay. Exactly. Next question. Uh, what do we know about Omicron in pregnancy? Okay, so unfortunately, it's, we haven't had enough time. Omicron came on fast and furious. So we don't have data on specifically on what Omicron does to pregnancy. We are just now actually getting a, more of the data on what Delta did in pregnancy. So there's going to be a lag time. So unfortunately, I can't speak to that. But what I'm going to do here is just go over some, some of the things that we do know about Omicron in general. Um, the first thing is it has a lot of mutations. Uh, that makes it more transmissible. And I know uh, much of you, many of you have already read about that. It is more transmissible. And as we can see by the uh, number of patient people that are getting it daily across the country. Um, and it's able to evade the passive immunity acquired from vaccination and as well as the natural immunity from previous infection. Um, breakthrough infections after vaccination are more common with Omicron than with Delta. Um, and that's just because it's got the more, more mutations and the vaccine efficacy is not as good against Omicron as it was for the, some of the other variants but that doesn't mean it's not working. Um, so we still want you to get vaccinated. We still want you to get boosted because that is that booster is going to increase your uh, immunity uh, back yep. to what it was when you first got the two doses. So it's important that if you're not boosted and you're eligible, meaning six months after the second dose of an mRNA or two months after the first dose of the J&J, that you get that booster. That'll help bring your immunity back up. Um, so we still should be getting vaccinated and boosted. The symptoms um, people have with Omicron appear to be less severe than with Delta. That's general. We don't have that data yet. That's what it's looking like. So for example, where I'm at, I'm having tons of patients come in for other indications, but they test positive for, for uh, COVID. I'm seeing more of that now than where there are a bunch of sick people coming in with Delta, but that doesn't mean they're going to, they stay asymptomatic or not as sick, if that makes right. sense. So we're just, I'm just seeing a, we're seeing a rash of patients coming in uh, that are pregnant that have Omicron, some of them sick, some of them not. Um, and then finally, let's see. If you do develop a breakthrough infection with what is assumed to be Omicron, depending on where, you at, where you're at, if you're in Texas, we're assuming it's Omicron. If you're where in, a, at a, at a, at a, you're in St. Louis, if it's in that area where it's not predominant, it may not be Omicron. Uh, we still recommend that you get, um, and you've had your two doses of the vaccine, still once you get well and get past that, you still need to get your booster. Um, and then finally, Absolutely. as with all the other variants, natural immunity, which means um, you got the infection in the past and you had now have natural immunity. So natural immunity from infection is not going to be as effective as if you got vaccinated or boosted, no matter what anybody tells you. We do know that vaccination and boosting gives you better protection than having the infection. So even if you've gotten infected in the past, we still recommend vaccination, vaccination and boosting. Finally, yeah, an pregnant, important note on timeline yeah. for that too, yes. is that a lot of um, patients are maybe hearing the wrong thing about when they can get vaccinated. You can get vaccinated 10 to 14 days as soon as your isolation period is over. And as long as you're not having any continuing symptoms, symptoms of dif yeah. difficulty breathing, yeah. um, the fever, having a little bit of a lingering cough 
or having a lingering lack of taste and smell, those don't count. But the things like, you know, difficulty breathing and fevers, as long as you're not having those symptoms and you're 10 to 14 days um, post your diagnosis, then you can get mm -hmm. the vaccine. But if you get monoclonal antibodies, it is a 90 yep. day wait for vaccination. And people ask why, why we have to wait 90 days after having monoclonal antibodies. Why is that? Um, you know, I meant to look that up and I actually forgot yeah. to look into it. I so think it, it just has to do with the antibody response that the, like a, a, caution, well, a we're, precaution. We're, I don't think there's any giving, published data on risk. But we're giving you the antibodies. So we're giving you the antibodies. You just wait for those to clear out and then we give you the booster or the vaccination. So yeah. that's why, you know, you, we're giving you those monoclonal antibodies to help you get the initial COVID infection. So you had those, that protection for a certain period of time. And then after that wanes, which is around the 90 day mark or starts, you know, a little bit before then that's when we recommend that you get boosted or vaccinated. So that's all because we're giving them to you through an IV, if that makes sense, rather than the, the vaccine. So for your yeah. point of and patients, go ahead. I was going to say, it's likely too, that even if you were to get it and you weren't told that information or something, there's probably no ill effect of it, but it's just one of yeah. those things where this is the guideline that we have. Yeah. So as far as your pregnant patients who are vaccinated and or boosted, I'm still telling them to wear a mask, especially now with Omicron. I'm still telling them to avoid, avoid large gatherings, socially distance, practice hand washing. Don't be around unvaccinated people. Don't, even if you're vaccinated or boosted, how are you, are you kind of taking the same stance with your pregnant patients? Oh, abs yeah. absolutely. I mean, we're, you know, into the pandemic now. And I think it's frustrating for people who have felt really constricted for two years that it's continuing to go on. Um, and I feel that, and I understand that for sure. I feel that way in my own life. You know, it's winter time right now. You might be able to hear my baby who got exposed mm -hmm. at daycare is quarantined at home oh, just outside yeah. that door. Um, we don't go anywhere. We don't do anything. We, you know, and it depends on what your region is and what your individual life circumstances I tell people are. So, mm -hmm. you know, when all of everyone I know is vaccinated, I'm lucky that most of my friends are doctors as well. And then my family has all been vaccinated and boosted. So when we were doing more social things, we were only hanging out with vaccinated individuals and still small groups and still preferred outside. Um, we've changed that right now, you know, and for the past few weeks, the surge is so bad. Yep. We, we aren't going anywhere. We don't have to, we yeah. are, you know, we were always masking, but we're doing it even more now. We're not even seeing our friends who are doctors because yep. spread is so bad that a lot yep. of healthcare providers are getting COVID. So it's important to remember that you have to change your plan sometimes. That's really frustrating. I think we're canceling a really important vacation for us, but this just mm -hmm. happens. And so yeah. I absolutely re recommend that to my pregnant patients, but we exist in the real world, right? Like childcare crises emerge. Mm -hmm. um, other family members or friends might need extra support that, that you know you need to help them or you know that they need to help you. So taking as many precautions as possible, yes. um, using available rapid tests to try to ensure that there's maybe not an infection currently, um, take as many steps as you can to do the things that you have to do. Um, but understand that this is a time during this surge where we need to be taking more precautions than we were three months ago or six months ago. Yeah, it's, just, you know, be as safe as you possibly can, but we understand that not everybody's life circumstances are going to allow you to do everything we would want you to do. We'd want to put you in a bubble if we could, but, you know, we have to be realistic. So just being as protective and mindful as you possibly can, even as a vaccinated or boosted pregnant individual, it's important to remember that we're in a surge right now and uh, we want to keep you protected. Okay, next question. Yeah. Um, it, yeah, go ahead. Uh, no, go ahead. Next question. What is known about adverse pregnancy and maternal outcomes if sick with COVID and unvaccinated? This is a great question because this is something you and I see every day at work mm -hmm. is that unvaccinated patients who have COVID have more severe outcomes when they're pregnant compared to non-pregnant. So we've known for a long time in this pandemic, even before vaccines were available, that if you were pregnant, you had a much higher risk of severe illness, needing oxygen support, needing ICU admission, needing a breathing tube, needing ECMO, which is a really dramatic heart-lung bypass, and dying than someone who had your same medical background but wasn't pregnant. Pregnancy just puts us way more at risk for these respiratory viruses. And so we've we continue to see that, even though vaccines are available, because yeah. frustratingly, not a majority of pregnant mm -hmm. patients are vaccinated. Mm -hmm. A majority of pregnant patients are still unvaccinated. Mm -hmm. So that was is continues to be very concerning. Um, but we have much data on breakthrough infections in pregnancy, meaning people who were vaccinated then did get COVID 
um, who were pregnant until recently, a study just yeah. came out. Um, it was done in the Oshner Health System, which is in Louisiana during the Delta surge this past mm -hmm. summer. Um, and it compared pregnant people who had COVID who were unvaccinated and people who were vaccinated. Now, unfortunately, in the sample, only 16% were vaccinated because there's a low vaccination rate um, in this population. But what they found is that the people who had the breakthrough infections compared to the unvaccinated infections had a lower rate of having um, a severe or critical COVID, had a lower mm -hmm. rate of ICU admission um, mm -hmm. and needing oxygen support. They also didn't quite have the power to compare the groups in this, but they did have in the unvaccinated group, one maternal death mm -hmm. and six stillbirths. Yep. Um, and none of those happened in the vaccinated group. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. we do have data that vaccination, and there's been studies that vaccination, in addition, this study showed, and other studies have shown that vaccination pregnancy decreases the risk of getting COVID at all. But then yep. if you do get a breakthrough infection, we're seeing protection from that severe disease, which is really encouraging. Yes, yes, yes. And, and we know, and we'll talk a little bit more in detail about this. We know that the more severe your disease is, especially if unvaccinated, the more we see the adverse maternal and uh, pregnancy outcomes. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. But one of the other things that we, we you talked to, uh, you mentioned a lot of things as far as maternal. Another thing with maternal outcomes in unvaccinated patients sick with COVID would be preeclampsia-like syndrome. And that can be, and, and yep. you know, the sicker you are in the third trimester towards delivery, those are when the worst outcomes occur if you have COVID around the time of delivery yeah. and you're sick. Um, but There's a great study that, showing that yes. dose response relationship yep. too. So the more severe yep. your COVID is, the more severe the preeclampsia yep. is yep. and earlier. So again, protecting you from severe illness will help protect from the preeclampsia probably. Right, right. And there's even some uh, potential link between having COVID at other times in pregnancy with mild uh, or even asymptomatic potentially and having uh, preeclampsia uh, pre later in pregnancy. And that's, and we'll talk about the placenta effects here in a little bit, but that's part of, probably due to what it does to the placenta. Its effects on the placenta are very similar to what happens with preeclampsia. Yep. So that's probably predisposing these people to preeclampsia. Yep. Uh, oh, here, here it is. That the, you know, we see acute infarcts, vascular congestion, thrombi in the vessels. These are all things that we see with preeclampsia. So this is what uh, and there's a whole list, and I, and I have a slideshow on my Instagram account if anybody's interested, but it, uh, there's a whole list of things that we see with placentas infected with uh, uh, COVID that is similar to what we see uh, when people have preeclampsia. So that's why the connection is there. Um, so it's important to know that as well. And then also, you know, this has been vertical. Mm -hmm, go ahead. No, I was going to say, and then also the placenta leads right into the fact that when the, you know, a big CDC study, you know, looking at data showed an increased yep. risk of stillbirth in yep. people who had had COVID during pregnancy. And again, we keep talking about things are usually more likely with severe disease. It can happen to anyone, but again, vaccination is going to decrease your risk of getting COVID at all. So yep. we'll probably decrease the risk of these types of outcomes, but certainly that's one of the most severe and hardest to tolerate right. outcomes of them all. Right. Um, as far as vertical transmission, we're still kind of, it depends on where you're, you're reading about whether or not vertical transmission actually happens. And that's where a pregnant individual yeah. has COVID. It actually goes through the placenta and infects the fetus. But we're getting more and more case reports and some studies that are, are showing that that's likely yeah. happening. There's reports of congenital infection um, from vertical transmission that has called, caused congenital myocarditis or infection inflammation of the heart. First trimester infection associated with uh, pregnancy loss. A uh, baby was born with neonatal severe acute respiratory syndrome uh, when the uh, pregnant individual had it at the time of delivery. Stillbirth, and yep. I think something that we've seen here is stillbirth with preeclampsia, DIC, massive abruption. We've seen that and also hemorrhage with COVID infection at the time of delivery as well. Um, so those are all things that can happen when someone has COVID infection uh, around the time of delivery um, uh, when they're unvaccinated. I have never seen it in someone that is vaccinated. So there is something to be said for that. That's just my own personal experience as an MFM. What about you? Have you seen any uh, uh, hemorrhaging or anything like that with COVID infection at the time of birth? Oh, definitely. I mean, we've definitely seen that. And additionally, you know, it feels like everything is a little bit more complicated and difficult when someone has severe COVID at the time of their delivery. Yeah. Um, like, just our healthcare planning and our ability to have staff there, you know, putting yeah. on PPE first, et cetera. It's just yeah makes everything a little bit more getting supplies in and out of the room. So, you know, it certainly goes beyond just um, someone being critically ill from COVID. It really kind yeah. of has domino effects in our healthcare mm -hmm. system and healthcare delivery of an individual patient. Yeah. Okay. Next question. 
What is known about adverse uh, pregnancy and maternal outcomes of sick with COVID and vaccinated or boosted? Uh, so first of all, we don't have any data specifically, as I said before, on Omicron variant and those who get it after being vaccinated or boosted. Um, there was this recent study that looked at um, the incidence of severe or critical COVID in vaccinated compared with unvaccinated pregnant patients. And this was during the Delta variant. Um, there were, it, it, well, this is the one you said was uh, the in uh, Oshner Health System. Um, they had yep. uh, 1,332 1, vaccinated patients, uh, 8,700 incomplete vaccinated, and that was about a 13% vaccination rate. Vaccinated patients had a lower odds of severe or critical illness and COVID-19 of any severity. Uh, even those who had not finished a complete two-dose series still had yep. less severe disease. And, and the, they, they even looked one at mostly, helped. yeah, even one helped. Um, they found that the use of adjunctive medical therapy Typically, when someone's sick with COVID, they'll get monoclonal antibodies, steroids, remdesivir, which is the, the antiviral, uh, oxygen. So they found that the use of adjunctive medical therapy was rare for vaccinated patients. And no vaccinated patients, none, needed supplemental oxygen, oxygen or ICU admission. And then finally, in the unvaccinated group, as Dr. Perez had said earlier, one maternal death secondary to COVID-19 complications, six stillbirths in the unvaccinated group, um, and three of these six had COVID earlier in pregnancy and ended up with a stillbirth. So that's important to know as well. Um, so they basically said there's an association between vaccination and lower odds of severe or critical uh, disease and, and disease of any severity and pregnant patients during the Delta variant. So I'm sure the same is gonna be with Omicron, even though you know Omicron doesn't seem to be causing uh, as bad of illness in pregnant individuals, you still don't know where you're gonna fall in that spectrum as a pregnant individual, well, I right? It's so true. And the other thing with Omicron too, that, you know, we just don't know yet. And I certainly don't want to inspire fear by saying this is that it seems that Omicron infects cells differently. So whereas that yep. may be a good thing in terms of severe respiratory illness, if it infects the lungs less, but maybe like, you know, the upper yep. respiratory tract more, but the lungs less, we don't know what that different infection might yeah. look like for blood vessels, which can affect the placenta or for vertical transmission. So we don't know what that effect could be OB rise, right? There are other viruses that don't cause critical yeah. respiratory illness, but still negatively affect a pregnancy. So, you know, I certainly don't want to stoke fear about it. You know, mm -hmm. if you're vaccinated, if you're taking precautions, you're doing everything you reasonably can, you know, Dr. Clark and I still have to go to work. Mm -hmm. We still have to see COVID yeah. patients. We can't just eliminate those exposures because it's our, careers. It's yeah. our jobs and it's our mission. So I understand that people are doing everything they can, including getting vaccinated. And I don't want to stoke fear, but with Omicron, it's important to say that it might be less severe in our respiratory tract, but we don't know what it means for pregnancy yet. Yeah. And I'm just going to say this. Um, no, I don't want to fear monger. I mean, people love to say fear monger on mm -hmm. social media, but when you're on the other side of it as someone like myself, someone is like Dr. Perez, and we see the things. Now, I can't come on social media and tell you about every bad outcome I've seen with COVID that's not a, appropriate. My stance have been, has been to educate, and I don't want to come in and scare people to death, but y'all have to understand we're seeing what happens on the front line, and we know what happens. That's why we're here educating as much as we possibly can to get people vaccinated. So um, we come from a place of seeing it and knowing what it can happen what, knowing what can happen. And we just don't want to keep seeing that in our pregnant patients. Right. Yeah. It, it's and it's hard. difficult. It's hard. It's mm -hmm. difficult too. And I'm sure you can relate to this is that in real life at work, most of my patients are unvaccinated. Yeah. And so I'm seeing these severe outcomes and yeah. some are vaccinated and they're doing really well. I haven't mm -hmm. seen them have severe symptoms. We don't have to admit no. them to the hospital. No. You know, they might have an asymptomatic or a mildly symptomatic infection. Mm -hmm. um, but on social media, what I get is a lot um, of concern from people who are vaccinated and they are boosted and they're getting COVID anyways, or having a lot of fear and anxiety around COVID, even though they're doing way more than my, than my patients are. So yeah. unfortunately, sometimes our message can be aimed towards the pop we're hope who we're hoped to be reaching are the patients we are serving in real life, even, or, you know, not you and me, yeah. but everywhere else in the country, because um, I see those patients in real life. Yeah. Um, and sometimes that's why I say I don't want to stoke fear because I know that no, a lot of the no. people who are here on this live today no. are vaccinated, are boosted, and they're boosted, doing yep. everything they can. But like, if I get COVID, if my son gets COVID and I get COVID, I mean, I had to go to work. He had to go to care, mm -hmm. you know? So people mm -hmm. can do everything they can and they can still get it's, COVID and yep. that's okay. Yep. But we will do want to give information and we hope that maybe someone here who's watching 
is pregnant, they haven't received the vaccine yet, and they learn something and they go get vaccinated. Nope. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then there was one preprint article that I found. And again, preprint means it's not peer reviewed, but it's not printed yet, but there is a server that lists these articles. Uh, so it's a great way tool to kind of see what's out there. Um, basically, this was a prospective cohort study that collected data on hospitalized pregnant patients uh, with confirmed symptomatic COVID infection compared to the se severity of infection and perinatal outcomes across the different variants. So we go from wild type was first, then alpha, then delta, now we're in Omicron. Of over 3,000 pregnant persons, um, the, pr the proportion that experienced moderate to severe infection significantly increased from wild type to alpha, alpha to, to delta. That's to be expected. That's what we've, mm -hmm. we've seen. Um, yep. Symptomatic patients admitted in the alpha period were more likely to have uh, respiratory support and have pneumonia and be admitted to the ICU. That increased with delta. But the key and the reason why I'm bringing this up is this. No fully vaccinated pregnant individuals were admitted to the hospital between January and November. None in this cohort study. That's crucial to know that. So the vaccinations are working to keep you from getting severe disease and hospitalization, which is what the goal was and is. So even if you get breakthrough infection, you are still less likely to need hospitalization and have these adverse outcomes because you're vaccinated, right? Exactly. That's yeah. like and the which, money, which is what we the want. money statement right there. That's yep. what we want, yeah. We want to keep you out of the hospital. We want to keep you from having severe disease and hospitalization because once you get severe disease, once you get hospitalized with COVID, it's hard to manage a, a sick pregnant individual and then you likely will need to be delivered or even worse. So that's, mm -hmm. it's to keep you from getting to that point, which vaccinations are clearly doing. Mm -hmm. um, okay, next question. And decreasing the chances of getting it at all, which is even though you're and seeing breakthrough it, infections, yes. Yes. it's important to remember, yes, you can have a breakthrough infection, but you'll have less of a chance of getting it at all. Getting it, too. Yep, yep, exactly. And I've seen, heard, have had dozens of stories. I got vaccinated and boosted my child got it or somebody in my family got it and who couldn't get vaccinated and I didn't get it. So yeah. it is protecting pregnant individuals. It is. Okay. Next question. Are most people who experience adverse pregnancy or maternal outcomes unvaccinated? Absolutely. I mean, you just yeah. shared that preprint article saying that um, it's what we see clinically all of the time. So it's really reassuring and heartwarming. It's really frustrating for the person because they're like, I did everything and I still got it, but it's really great for us because we're like, mm -hmm. yes, but I can tell you to go home from triage. I don't have to yeah. admit you and talk to the ICU and have discussions about who will make decisions for the baby if you never get to meet yeah, your yeah. baby because you die before, it, which we've both, mm -hmm. I'm sure, seen happen. Mm -hmm. So yep. yes, yep. it is absolutely a lack of adverse outcomes. And the other outcomes like a likelihood for preeclampsia or not, or something like stillbirth, you know, we would suppose that those risks are going to be lower. We don't have data on that. It will take a while to get data on that, but I assume it's probably coming. Somebody, one of our smart colleagues somewhere is working on it. Um, yeah. But absolutely, we just see the, in terms of maternal illness, we absolutely see a decrease in that. So that's yeah. great. Okay, next question. What do we know about asymptomatic COVID infection and adverse maternal or pregnancy outcomes when unvaccinated or vaccinated boosted? We don't, I looked up articles on adverse pregnancy outcomes when vaccinated and boosted didn't see much. But when you talk about adverse pregnancy outcomes uh, when vaccinated, uh, sorry, when unvaccinated, um, I'm just going to go over some of them. Um, there was a big study that was a meta-analysis and systematic review. Pregnant women with Black or Asian ethnicity were more likely to be symptomatic than those with white ethnicity, who were mostly asymptomatic, uh, compared to Black or Asian uh, individuals. Pregnant persons with, uh, sorry, cesarean delivery rate was more likely amongst symptomatic pregnant patients when compared with asymptomatic. Um, and also those who were asymptomatic um, had a higher chance of having a vaginal delivery. So if you're symptomatic, you're more likely to end up with a C-section. If you're asymptomatic, more likely to end up with a vaginal delivery. Uh, the mean birth weight was significantly lower um, and the odds of having a preterm birth are, more, yeah. are increased if you have yep. a symptomatic disease. Uh, those with preeclampsia or pregnancy-induced hypertension were more likely to be symptomatic. We talked mm -hmm. about that. Um, and then we talked about maternal ICU admission. Um, and then also NICU admission, because mostly because of preterm birth and pre birth weight. Yep. Yeah. Um, and then you have, if you have comorbid comorbidities and then ethnicities, a black race, that's going to increase your risk of having symptomatic disease yeah. um, and then having complications as well. So that was one study. Let's see. There was another one. Um, we already talked about, wait, actually, we already talked about that. Uh, so basically the, the gist of this, 
if you have COVID and you're asymptomatic, um, you're less likely to have severe disease and adverse maternal and uh, pregnancy outcomes. Although there are some data that are showing that even if you have asymptomatic disease, there could be a link, again, probably linked to what it's doing with the placenta, to having preeclampsia yep. later, having stillbirth, or having an adverse outcome later on in pregnancy, even if asymptomatic. That's still being kind of teased out. But yeah. um, after doing the reading that I've done for this, it's more likely related to having asymptomatic infection earlier on in pregnancy, um, recovering, and then maybe later on in pregnancy, having preeclampsia or stillbirth or uh, something like that based on what uh, the asymptomatic, uh, asymptomatic infection did to the placenta. Is that kind of what you're reading as well? Yeah, absolutely. And it was interesting. We had some data from our institution when we started screening everyone um, on admission to labor and delivery. We found that there was a higher rate of asymptomatic positives in mm. pregnant patients compared to the same age matched population of scheduled surgery, right? So there were a lot of young people who might be having a scheduled surgery, things like tubals, gynecologic surgeries, you know, appendectomies, yeah. things like that, um, gallbladders. And we found a higher rate of asymptomatic infection. Mm -hmm. um, like incidental positives on just mm -hmm. admission for delivery um, than in other populations. Now, it's important to note too that there's a truly asymptomatic infection and then there's just a testing positive pre-symptomatically asymptomatic yep. at the time yep. go on to develop in, um, uh, symptoms which can be severe mm -hmm. too. So, um, so yeah, it's interesting and I don't think we fully understand why those things are. Mm -hmm. I mean, that data was from early in the pandemic for us. It still happens, yeah. but I feel like it mo more frequently, at least during Delta, was pre-symptomatic, like the on admission, they were positive. And they're like, weird, I have no symptoms. But then by postpartum day three, yep. they were like, we I'm, getting that a lot cough, too. Yeah. I'm getting a fever. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. it was all starting to hit them. So Yeah, we said, we, I mean, so you really can't tell when someone comes in asymptomatic and positive. Uh, I've seen it too. They yeah. stay asymptomatic, but then some of them go on to develop uh, illness as well. Yeah. So you don't really know who that person is going to be. Uh, okay, next question. How worried should I be if I get COVID after being vaccinated or boosted? Now, if I get it and it's Omicron or even in some places where Omicron is not predominant and it could still be Delta, how worried should I be if I'm vaccinated or boosted and I get COVID? So I would say since we don't yet have a ton of data about those distant pregnancy outcomes, things like preeclampsia or stillbirth, I would maintain a really close communication with your OB provider. So let them know that you had COVID, you know, how many weeks you were when you had COVID so that they can keep updated on different guidelines that may come out and that they can take things that might happen a little more seriously when they happen. Things like, you know, watching your blood pressures maybe more closely. Um, maybe they would advise you to get a blood pressure cuff at home or something to keep tabs on it. Also keeping a good count of fetal movement. Um, for fetal well-being. So I just think that it's something just to keep your doctor in the loop about. Um, mm -hmm. I would be encouraged that you were vaccinated and or hopefully boosted um, and that say that those risks are less likely than someone who is unvaccinated. But of course, we just want to um, keep tabs on you and just have make sure that, you know, everything, every box is being checked. It's almost like having an additional comorbidity, I would say, mm -hmm. um, just that one extra layer of complication there. Yeah, so it, it, even if you're vaccinated or boosted and you get COVID, uh, obviously let your provider know um, if you happen to get diagnosed because you're at the hospital for some other reason, ask about what to look for. If you happen to get diagnosed because you are symptomatic, ask what to look for because the chances are that you're not going to be as sick that you need to stay in the hospital, thankfully. Um, you know, what worsening signs and symptoms to look for once you go home. Um, and, you know, if you are sick with COVID or have asymptomatic COVID, um, and you are a high risk pregnancy. Um, you need to make plans during that period where, you know, you may or may not, you, you're, you're quarantining or isolating for your routine prenatal care. Yeah. Uh, it doesn't mean we, you get to fall off the earth or they should expect you to fall off the earth until you're okay. Uh, even if you're low risk, find out what you do about the routine visits that you might miss say in that two week, next two weeks. Yeah. Um, because we, we can't just, especially the higher risk patients, we can't just say, I'll see you in two weeks. See ya. Right. Uh, you know, there's still things that we need to do, especially for those that have complications of pregnancy, right? Yeah. So sometimes we arrange to see those people at the hospital in yep. special rooms to do yep. whatever visit is necessary. Sometimes telehealth is sufficient. Um, sometimes, you know, we ask you to get a blood pressure cuff or something. So there's a lot of creative workarounds based on your own um, history and your own needs in pregnancy for what the plan of action should be, but definitely communicate mm -hmm. it with your OB provider. 
Yeah. Uh, next question. Are there studies showing growth restriction or any other adverse effects in babies after COVID vaccination and pregnancy? The answer is no. Where this question came from is that a provider had told a patient uh, that messaged me, their patient, that there were studies showing growth restriction. That is absolutely not true. No. When we are doing studies on the outcomes of pregnancies and those who got vaccinated, which by default is also assessed as the safety of these vaccines, we typically yep. look for composite outcomes. And that's going to uh, include a group of in, uh, yep. things like growth restriction, preterm birth, you know, um, maternal, other uh, adverse uh, things that can happen in pregnancy. And growth restriction is usually included. So they're going to report a growth restriction rate, but none of these things have been above what we would see exactly pre-pandemic. So it's not like we're seeing more because people are vaccinated. It's, no. it, you, we look at that to see if we're seeing more and we're not. So the good thing is, is that any safety data we have on, on uh, the vaccination and pregnancy is favorable. We've seen no red flags. We've exactly. seen no worries about miscarriage because nothing is greater than what we see in the background rate for a pregnancy loss or anything else like that, uh, other complications in pregnancy. Um, so, Which makes sense the, because we couldn't yeah. even think of a mechanism that it would cause. For most things, we know a mechanism that could cause a negative yeah, outcome yeah. and it may or may not happen, but we can't even think of a mechanism. There's yeah. not even a theoretical risk. I, 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 but we know the mechanism that COVID infection causes these exactly. things. Exactly. Exactly. And something that I, and something that I started telling patients too, especially in the last like, well, really during Delta, I started telling people mm -hmm. is I think that when the vaccines first became available and people felt hesitant, which again they only feel hesitant because of misinformation, because all of the real data is very reassuring and it is cost for no hesitation at all. However, people see a lot of misinformation; they feel hesitant. Mm -hmm. I used to tell them. I think that people used to say, I'm undecided about the vaccine and I'm going to try not to get COVID. But now we're seeing, we saw during Delta and we're seeing even more in this wave that that's not the two choices anymore. The two choices are get vaccinated or get COVID. Nope. And so, yes, mm -hmm. you can get COVID after being vaccinated, but we know, as we said it again and again, the rates of even getting it are lower. And even if you do, the rates of complications are lower. So you can't just say, well, I'm just going to cross my fingers and toes and wear my mask and try to not leave my house and I won't get COVID because people are getting it and they're like, I don't leave my house. I don't do anything. I always wear a mask. So mm -hmm. getting vaccinated will absolutely help if you're unvaccinated. Yeah. So, and just while we're on this topic, uh, there's so much misinformation out there and we've been fighting this for two years. And in the meantime, we're losing pregnant patients and babies. We are. Uh, but those people that are spreading this misinformation have no vested interest in that. They don't have to deal with it. So why are we here? Because we see it and we're trying to prevent it by yep. getting people vaccinated and boosted. It's so, so important. Um, this whole thing about natural immunity, I got COVID, I'm fine. No, you're not fine. Natural immunity, yes, you, ha you will have some natural immunity from having COVID infection in pregnancy, but we know there are adverse outcomes with COVID infection and pregnancy, even later on in the pregnancy. Yeah. So you and natural immunity wanes faster than vaccine yeah. immunity yes. too. So right. why settle for, you know, a C minus in class if you could have an A and get vaccinated? Yeah. That's a good way to put it. Maybe it only so speaks to people like you and me. <laughs> right, right. So what are the risks of getting the booster in, in, uh, in pregnancy? What's the, what are the risks of getting the booster? There are none. There are no documented risks of vaccination in pregnancy, depending on trimester at all. Um, yeah. We recommend the flu vaccine in any trimester of pregnancy when it's flu season. So if anyone, we've talked a lot about COVID mm -hmm. vaccine, but if anyone hasn't gotten flu vaccine, please get it um, for many of the same reasons as COVID, because it can be more severe um, in pregnancy than in non-pregnancy. Yeah. Um, so yes, vaccination, booster, any trimester. I see a lot of talk about concerns about fever. However, yes. the data saying that fever is a risk to pregnancy, you know, isn't great data anyway. It yep. may be the, not the fever itself, but the underlying illness, which again, yep. avoid the illness, get the vaccine. Yep. And even if you do feel like you're getting a fever, you can take Tylenol safely to reduce mm -hmm. the fever. So no yep. risk of getting vaccinated or boosting in any specific trimester, or any time in pregnancy, get the vaccine as soon as possible and get the booster as soon as you're eligible. The next question would be, that's a great point, and, and I'm totally on board with that. Get it, and we'll touch on one more study, and then we're going to uh, look at some questions. How long do the antibodies last for a baby after birth? We get vaccinated or boosted while pregnancy, pregnant or breastfeeding. We don't have a good answer. Um, those studies are going to be hard to do because you'd have to study a lot of babies to see how long. You'd also have to long... take babies 
blood or just study the outcomes well, yeah. of them getting it. And right. there's a lot um, of confounders there. Yes. Um, yeah. I will say that we can extrapolate a Are you still there? Okay. Can you hear me? Uh, yeah, no. Uh -huh. I just got a low uh, battery alert on my phone. So oh. hopefully it doesn't die. I don't know why yeah. it's running through so fast, okay. but um, hopefully it doesn't die. But we can extrapolate from some other things. Like for example, we give um, Tdap vaccination pregnancy to prevent infants from getting pertussis. And mm -hmm. that protection from pertussis lasts, I think there's a decreased rate throughout the first year. Mm -hmm. Definitely more dramatic earlier on in the first year, but I do think that we're, you see even lower. And that's both because there were antibodies passed during pregnancy and because when loved ones who are around the infant are yep. boosted with pertussis, yep. right, um, then they're less likely to get it and pass it on. So there's right. that two mechanisms of protection there. There's the protection through antibodies and there's the protection through cocooning because yep. if you're vaccinated, you're less likely to get it or give it. Right. So, you know, we don't have those answers, but we do know that the antibodies are found in cord blood. We know they're found in breast milk, yep. which means the neonate are getting them. Um, and, you know, again, those studies are just going to take a long time, if ever, because again, like Dr. Perez said, there's a lot of confounding factors. Um, but the good thing to know is that twofold, you're passing the antibodies on and you're protected, which every adult that's protected around a neonate helps to protect that neonate. Yeah. Um, so it's a good point to know. Uh, again, when's the best time to get vaccinated? I'm not going to go through the study. It's an excellent study. I posted it yesterday. Please go back to my Instagram and look at the slides. I also the best have it on my stories. On your, yes, your stories, in my okay. highlights. Yep. Okay. The best time to get vaccinated is now. This study showed that even if you got vaccinated up to six weeks before getting pregnant, you can still have antibodies passed on during pregnancy and uh, in, in the cord blood that, that was being uh, drawn at uh, delivery. So uh, I think the optimal time is about three weeks pre-delivery, a pre-pregnancy, uh, but any time during the pregnancy. And they also showed that if you happen to fall where you got boosted in pregnancy, especially in the third trimester, that was the highest level of maternal antibody yep. or antibodies in the cord blood. But it doesn't really matter. Uh, it's neither here nor there. The good thing is that they saw vaccination in the first trimester, vaccination in the second. They all had antibodies at delivery, yep. which is great. But because of Omicron, we need that booster if you're eligible. Uh, yep. and you're pregnant, go ahead and get that booster because that is going to be beneficial. But the most important thing to, to know is that giving antibodies to the fetus or the neonate is a bonus. We need you protected. You, the person that's making the baby, has to be protected. So do not delay getting your vaccination exactly. or your booster. You need to get it because if you get sick because you're waiting and you got exposed, that's not going to help the pregnancy. So right. you come first in this, right? Exactly right. The pregnant the patient comes first. The fetus is dependent on you to have high oxygen yeah. levels, to be healthy. So protecting yourself through vaccination is absolutely the way to go. Yeah. So um, let's see. Let's go ahead and answer some questions. Look at some questions. And there's going to be a lot. We're not going to get to all of them, so bear with me. Oh, good Lord. There's a lot. Let's see. Okay. If they just got over getting COVID, when can I get the booster? We already talked about this. So basically you wait till you're out of your uh, isolation or quarantine period. Um, and then and as long as you're not symptomatic or have any major symptoms, you can get it, right? Yep, absolutely. Yep, 10 to 14 days, as long as you're not actively having fevers or difficulty breathing or other severe symptoms. Can you get COVID more than once? Yes. Yes, <laughs> you can. Because natural immunity is not as good as vaccine immunity. Right. Uh... Any known issues to babies uh, with a COVID positive parent who is boosted and are mildly symptomatic or asymptomatic? So, we, I mean, we don't have that specific data, but um, the way it's looking, the way it looks in general is that the less severe or less symptoms you have, the less likely you're going to have maternal or, uh, sorry, a pregnancy or maternal out adverse outcomes um, uh, if you're boosted or vaccinated. That's the way it's looking. Okay. Absolutely agree. Mm. Uh, we just talked about the antibodies. Uh, 26 weeks pregnant, not vaccinated. Had mild symptoms last week, still tested positive, but symptom free. Should I be worried about lasting effects or risks of COVID infection? We kind of talked about that a little bit. Yeah. Yeah, we talked about that. I, I'm um, glad that that person stayed mildly symptomatic, but there's certainly risks in the pregnancy of preeclampsia or stillbirth because, and those risks would be higher for unvaccinated than vaccinated individuals. Yeah. Um, let's see. 
Someone just asked, so what is the difference if you get the vaccine or not, if you can still get COVID? Important to yeah. remember that although you can get COVID after getting the vaccine, it is much less likely. And if you do, it is almost impossible to have severe symptoms. We haven't seen it based on any of the data that vaccinated pregnant people are having any severe symptoms, whereas that's very common if you're unvaccinated. So yes, yeah. it's possible, just like with every vaccine, it's not, vaccines mm -hmm. don't prevent infection, they prevent complications and death. Yeah. Is there any difference in terms of risk depending on which trimester someone had COVID? So the way this, the, the data look is that if you are sick around the time of delivery, or if you get it in a third trimester around the time of delivery, that's when people tend to have the worst outcomes. Is that what you're seeing as well? Yeah, and it's important to go back to even what we knew in 2019 before we even knew yeah. what COVID was. We already yeah. knew that other respiratory infections like the flu yeah. were more likely to be severe in pregnant people, particularly as pregnancy progresses because the effects yep. of the physiology of pregnancy, both the like blood volume, the lung capacity, the oxygen carrying capacity, we talked about all of that changes. And so it's definitely, you have a higher chance of being more severe and having more severe illness as pregnancy goes on. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, would you recommend a fourth vaccine for pregnant persons? That's not even an option right now. We're, right. we're only at the, the two dose vaccine series for mRNA, one for J&J, &J, and then a booster. Um, and just yep. uh, so we know that right now, the ACOG and SMFM both, uh, now that we have the mRNA more widely available, re do recommend the mRNA vaccine in pregnancy. Over so, uh, over yeah. over J&J. Um, but you can mix and mass, mix match the boosters, but uh, primarily we recommend mRNA vaccines in pregnancy over the J&J vaccine, which is a different type of vaccine. Yep. Um, let's see. We just talked about that one. Uh, impact to the placenta if you're vaccinated and have had COVID. I have not seen any studies on looking at placentas and in vaccinated individuals, um, but you can ascertain from not either A, not getting uh, uh, severe disease right. or symptomatic that it's less likely the placenta is going to be infected. And having lower viral loads. Typically having people who are yeah. vaccinated have lower viral loads, so the chances of complications are going to be lower too. Yeah. Did you look in? Is it safe to be working in person with Omicron? I'm 35, have a heart condition. I'm on the line for gestational diabetes and I'm pregnant with an IVF baby. I'm vaccinated with Moderna and boosted. Um, working in person. So I'm guessing this is, you're asking about you working. That's only a decision you can make. No, it's a it, hard for, one. It's hard. I mean, you, you, you know, we can't say, no, you should not work. Right. That's not, that's not fair. Puts your life at risk. Yeah. You know? I mean, you, you got yeah. a family and yourself to take care of. You have to make that decision. If, you can't, you don't have another option and you can't work from home, then you have to be in person unless you have the, the ability to not work at all. But, but hopefully you can risk, can make. yeah. And hopefully you can risk mitigate at work. You yep. can mask, you can um, try to unfortunately eat lunch alone, things like that. Um, but it's hard because you're right. I, I, mm -hmm. I get, it's so hard. We get questions like this because we can't tell someone not to work because it puts their livelihood at risk and their access to healthcare at risk because yep. insurance is tied to employment. So it's really tough, but working with human resources at your job or working with your supervisor to try to limit your risk is what I recommend. Uh, let's see. Let's see, let's see, let's see. How about COVID and breastfeeding? We didn't really talk a whole lot about that. Yeah. Um, so Okay, I actually did uh, a slideshow on uh, COVID uh, and uh, vaccine and lactation. Um, basically, what we're seeing when people get COVID, uh, sorry, oh, COVID, the COVID infection. Just got my first dose yesterday and son threw up and has diarrhea. Uh, oh, for the vaccine. So uh, that's not a typical side effect on what we've seen in infants who, uh, whose parent got vaccinated during uh, lactation. So... Um, what we mostly see is a, a, a decline or an increase in breast milk. The color of the breast milk might change. The neonate might be a little fussy, but again, these things you, you can't really, it, it, it's so hard. You to can't. Tease out, you as know, someone who got their vaccine, vaccine yeah. I know. As yeah, someone who got their vaccine with a two week old and then a five week old, when I got my Pfizer's last year, as anyone knows, babies, whether they're fussy or happy or have diarrhea, like, it changes based on the day, based on anything, you know, like I'm like, it's raining outside. My baby is extra fussy, you know? So there haven't been any negative associations or links. I would say anecdotally, people have told yeah. me there's an increase in my breast milk or there was maybe a decrease, but it was right back the second day. So I just encourage people to stay hydrated. There yeah. have been studies on antibody presence in breast milk, mm -hmm. and we do see great antibody responses in breast milk. Um, and so, you know, 
there's probably a, a level of protection there, you know, yeah. taking just any respiratory virus, the amount of protection that breast milk provides is about a 20 to 30% decrease in lower respiratory infections and ear infections in exclusively breastfed infants. But yes, totally safe to be vaccinated when breastfeeding and it can offer some degree of protection. Um, I actually contributed my breast milk to mm. a breast milk study that we did mm. at WashU that the pediatricians did in um, collaboration with some of the OBGYNs and there was great antibody responses after Good. vaccination of me and the other individuals. Perfect. We're going to close out with this question right here because I get this one all the time. What about the recommendation of taking low-dose aspirin if you get COVID in pregnancy for how long you should mm. take it? First of all, that's not a recommendation. And I'll explain why. For ACOG and SMFM and all the protocols we have for treating pregnant patients with COVID, the only recommendation we have regarding any kind of anticoagulation, which is kind of what aspirin's doing, although it's not a full-dose anticoagulation type protocol, is for those that are hospitalized and sick with COVID. Once they're home, there are no recommendations for anything. Low-dose aspirin, heparin, Lovenox, and I see patients getting it all the time, even those that did not get hospitalized. So I'm not, there's no, all I can say is there's no formal recommendation. If that's what yeah. your provider puts you on, you can ask them why. Um, my guess is what these uh, obstetrical care providers are kind of extrapolating to the low-dose aspirin for prevention of preeclampsia. Yeah. Since uh, we know that COVID causes a preeclampsia type syndrome. However, we do not have data that show that low-dose aspirin is going to have the same effect uh, in someone that has COVID. So yeah. um, again, it may or you... may not work is what I would tell people. I yes. think aspirin yeah. is so interesting in pregnancy because yes. some OBGYNs and high-risk OB doctors are almost arguing that maybe everyone should be on aspirin. And there are some mm -hmm. guidelines that say even one moderate risk factor, which yeah. it, being your first pregnancy would be one, you could consider taking low-dose aspirin. So Whereas aspirin isn't something that I think is harmful in any way. We just don't have any data that it really yeah. helps you if COVID's your only indication for having it. That yeah. being said, if your provider put you on it, I wouldn't say, oh, that was not a good move. I would just say, ah, uh, there's no data yeah. that it helps. Yeah. Is, will it hurt? Very unlikely. But yeah. yeah, I think aspirin's interesting. I agree with you though. I'm not using it as, I'm not no. giving it to patients who have had COVID. Um, We're not they either. Were and otherwise a candidate for aspirin. Yeah. The only time my patients get uh, ask baby aspirin is if they are indicated for what we know, and I've done recently done a slide on this, about the indications for yep. baby aspirin uh, or low-dose aspirin for prevention of preeclampsia. COVID yep. is not considered that. So exactly. um, at this that, point, you know, though in yeah, the future, who knows? Yeah, yeah. yeah, and I'm a high-risk obstetrician uh, who is at a large academic center. We have not adopted that practice because Neither the have evidence we. is just not there. So Exactly the um, same here. We have not adopted that. Um, I wouldn't freak out if you're taking it, if you're a follower who's taking it, but um, but I, we're not recommending it either. Yeah. So we'll close in on that. Thank you so much. Uh, I, I bet your baby's ready for you. So <laughs> get to your baby and thank you for this time. I will yeah, this it so up, fun. Um, and, uh, we'll try to visit the questions in the comments. If you guys have any other questions that we didn't get to put them there and we'll try to get to them and answer those as best as we can. Thank you yeah. so much. Have a great rest of your week. Bye. I appreciate you being here. Thank Take you. Take care. Bye. Bye.